embryo transfer just in my my life has changed a fair amount i mean the very first calf that was born from a frozen frozen embryo was in 1975 and that's i guess that's a long time for some people but if you think about it it's really not that long ago and then there was an and the original collections were all surgical the transfers were all surgical and there was a time a period of time there over about 10 years where there was an explosion really uh, of advances in embryo transfer. We went from surgical to non-surgical collections and surgical transfers to non-surgical transfers. We went from not being able to freeze embryos to be able to freeze embryos and produce, produce pregnancies. And there's actually more embryos frozen, thawed, and transferred now than there are fresh embryos annually in the U.S. And so frozen embryos are a big deal. And it's, it's been a great time to be involved in reproduction in cattle. We didn't know a lot of things that we know now uh, because of ultrasound. Uh, just, it, we just know a lot more about a cattle's reproductive cycle than we ever knew. So for me, it's been a really, really exciting time to, to be involved in, in cattle reproduction. We take a cow uh, who, who, is a, who would be a donor that, that our client has selected for whatever reason he or she sees fit for genetic merit usually, but uh, for whatever reason they, they, uh, they say they'll select a cow to become a donor. Uh, she just needs to be healthy in good condition, cycling and reproductively normal. And then we will initiate a program where uh, instead of her just ovulating one uh, oocyte that can be fertilized, we'll uh, induce her to have multiple ovulations and there's a series of injections that we put her through to do that to accomplish that. So we'll do that. Uh, she'll come into heat. We'll uh, AI or usually uh, AI her, and then seven days later, then we'll uh, collect embryos. The embryos are uh, uh, get in her uterus uh, on about day five, five days after she was in heat, and then but they're they're best collected around day seven. So we're collecting embryos out of this cow uh, seven days after she was in heat. And then these embryos, uh, we'll process those for either fresh transfer if we have recipients that day. If we have more embryos than recipients, then we'll freeze uh, the remainder embryos for, for future use on days where we have less embryos than we have recipients. So that we always, uh, where we have recipients, we always put an embryo in them that way to maximize uh, recipient usage. Uh, there's really uh, three reasons that most people uh, do embryo transfer. Uh, one is they have a female that they can market offspring out of, either bulls or, or heifers and cows out, out, of this, uh, out of this donor. And they can either market live animals, uh, bulls or heifers, or they can freeze embryos for uh, domestic sales or potentially even international sales. That's, that's sort of the, the, the biggest reason probably. Uh, the second uh, most common reason would be for genetic gain. They're taking the top part of their herd, top whatever percent of their herd uh, that are genetically superior, that they've identified some, in some fashion, and then they use the, the less genetic uh, valuable animals as the recipients. And so uh, over time, they will improve the average genetics uh, in their herd. And then the third reason, uh, which is also viable, is for herd expansion. Uh, they've got uh, either a few donors and they just want to increase the number of purebred cattle they have so they can collect those cows and make more embryos and use commercial cows to increase the number of total number of uh, purebred cattle they have. Or they can go outside their own herd and simply buy frozen embryos and put those in cows. But so. For, for me, I think uh, herd expansion is, a, is another excellent way to use embryo transfer. And, the, and then the other thing, you know, your markets uh, out of these donors can be either live animals or, you know, there's a viable frozen embryo market out there as well. And so it gives you a, a, a chance to recoup your cost, you know, on your, on your donor. The donor is restrained in a, in a preferably a squeeze chute so that we can control her movements. Uh, the first thing I usually do is uh, I just look at the cow to make sure she's comfortable 
and, and happy uh, the way she stands there in the chute right now because it's going to be a little bit of a process and I want her to be, you know, comfortable and, and at ease while I'm working with her. I'll give her a caudal epidural and we just take 2% uh, lidocaine and, uh, and, and, put, and, and do a lidocaine epidural in that epidural space and basically what that does is that just uh, uh, relaxes her uh, so that she's not straining while I'm in her doing a rectal and just uh, she knows I'm back there but she's not concerned about it generally and because she really can't feel feel a whole lot or know what's going on so it's for it's for her comfort as well as mine uh, after after I administer that uh, I'll put put my arm in her and just uh, palpate or feel her ovaries to get some idea of how she responded a cow that we haven't super ovulated and you have to keep in mind this is seven days after she was in heat the cow that we haven't super ovulated should normally just have one ovulation site there uh, cows that we've super stimulated uh, and super ovulated uh, will have multiple multiple ovulation sites there so I put my arm in her uh, and, and just get some idea of, of uh, how well she stimulated and that helps me to uh, realize about how many we should get today it also uh, helps me uh, decide how to uh, adjust her for future collections after after we do that uh, I, I you know I dry wiper just with a dry uh, a paper towel. I avoid water and I avoid soap because embryos are uh, are hardy, but they they do not uh, tolerate uh, changes in their osmolarity like you'd have with water, or they certainly don't uh, tolerate disinfectants of any type. So, I simply dry wipe her good. Uh, I take I, I use uh, a, a, a catheter that has a balloon on it, and I simply uh, uh, take that catheter, put a stylet in it, and pass it through the cervix. Uh, I, I will uh, insert that catheter uh, usually up her right horn and then an assistant will uh, inflate the cuff on that balloon and I'm palpating that uh, cuff and her uterus through her rectum. I'll feel that cuff and, and know that it's inflated some and then I'll slide that back into the body of her uterus and engage her uh, internal os of her cervix, the, the, uh, the uh, innermost part of her cervix, and then we'll inflate that cuff just to seal her cervix off. Remove the stylet, hook our tubing on, and then we'll simply irrigate her uterus. And there's uh, different ways of doing it, uh, but you simply irrigate her uterus with uh, multiple infusions. We drain just simply by gravity flow her uterus through a filter. That filter uh, will then in turn trap all of her uh, uh, embryos and also her unfertilized uh, ovum and anything that's in her uh, uh, ovum wise. It also concentrates all the cellular debris and mucus, uh, which gives us something to look through. So after we have uh, feel like we've got her uh, uterus irrigated well and we've got all the ova out, we'll take that uh, filter, which has concentrated everything, and we'll simply take a, a syringe with media, spritz it into a dish, and the grids enable us to make sure that we uh, look at every area of the dish. And then from there, we'll sort out the good embryos from the non-transferables. And, and then with the good embryos, then we'll sort through those, assign a, a stage and a grade. The stage gives us some idea of how old the embryos are. And they can be uh, uh, 24 hours difference in age, even on the same day, just because some embryos grow a little faster than others. And then uh, the other thing we do is we assign a quality score. The stage helps us sync that embryo with a potential recip either that day or the future and then the quality score uh, gives us some idea of uh, conception rates and then what that does is it that way we can create sort of a, a uh, an expectation for the client on what he ought to be able to get on those embryos and then also uh, he can sell those embryos either as grade ones or grade twos and to turn that around you can purchase embryos and, and, and sometimes the purchase price is based on the quality so, so, and so from there, the embryos either get transferred or frozen and stored for future use. Deer track is using the embryo transfer just, just like the way I described it and using it for the right reasons. You know, he's, he's selecting superior females and uh, he's just implemented and, and made embryo transfer, 
you know, vital part of his uh, genetic improvement program as he has his AI program. You know, there's, there's lots of assisted reproductive technologies out there to use. Embryo transfer is one, I, AI is another, artificial insemination is another. And part of my responsibility is to help people decide how to use these, uh, these technologies so that they best utilize them. Embryo transfer is not for everybody. Some people aren't ready for that, uh, and, and just as artificial insemination isn't, but, but they're all tools that are out there that are available, and, and, and it's all of us uh, just need to work together to figure out the best way to implement them at each, each location, basically. And, and Bob's doing, a, in my opinion, a really good job uh, of doing that.